Heavenly Father, please do purify us uh, by your word, direct and guide us. We want to be useful to you, Heavenly Father. We want to be useful to your church. Uh, We want to take the gospel to the next generation. And so please uh, do encourage us and build us up in this passage today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you avoid a distorted gospel infiltrating the church? How do you uh, keep track, on track, in doctrine and belief within a church? How can a pastor and an eldership protect their congregation from false teaching? Uh, These are the concerns of the second half of 2 Timothy 2. And they're concerns for today. Among us, I know there are many who have concerns for friends and family. We know people being sucked into cults or friends, Uh, being sucked into cults and their false teaching. We know people tottering on the edge of Christianity and other religions at times mixing the two together. Friends who have rejected the clear teaching of the Bible and aren't living according to it. More broadly, we might be concerned about the church as a whole, knowing that the church has a real fight on its hands to stand up for some of the very central truths of the Bible. Now, 2 Timothy 2 is here to help us and guide us in this time and process. Uh, Paul, remember, uh, he's coming to the end of his ministry. He's writing to his student and fellow co-worker, Timothy, uh, commanding him to guard the gospel that he's been entrusted with from Paul, uh, directing Timothy and the church on how to do this. The call last week was to endure knowing that in the end, those who do endure will reign with Jesus. But we also remember that uh, Timothy has false teachers in and around his church. There's some Hymenaeus who have been kicked out of the church already in 1 Timothy, but they seem to be still around causing trouble. They have always been, this has always been the case for God's church. Uh, We are not special today and we don't need to be afraid. Nothing is new. Uh, I'm sure it's been worse and different. And so Paul says, here is how to deal with this. Here is how to keep the church on track with the good news about Jesus, protected, pure, and proclaimed. Uh, So keep your Bibles open to 2 Timothy as we hear from Paul how to stay on track. First, we see that our words matter, uh, our character matters, and then finally, our attitude to opposition matters. Uh, So first, we want to use our speech and God's word well. Uh, These are the actions of an approved worker in God's church. Paul begins by asking us to be clear and careful with our speech. Look at verse 14. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Remind them of these things. That there refers back to the trustworthy saying that we've heard. Keep remembering Jesus, the true Jesus, who walked the path of suffering onto glory. That is the first defense and the most important thing for any church, remembering Jesus. But furthermore, Paul says, uh, do not quarrel. He says it again, verse 16. But avoid a reverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. And again, verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. When we consider uh, the variety of commands that we're given here, first we want to understand that Paul cares very much about our speech and how we talk with with one another and what we talk about. There's a way of speaking that uh, Paul says ruins us and leads to more and more ungodliness a speech that creates a climate where the church easily moves away from the truth. The climate, I think, is one that's argumentative in nature, uh, intellectually competitive, and has a spirit of speculation on minor issues. A climate where we have to be right about everything, and we think we are. So we love to quarrel about things. 
or when we talk too much about things that are not central to the message of the risen Lord Jesus, and so we enjoy controversies. More directly, there are some topics of heresy which we should avoid altogether, have nothing to do with them, Paul says. Topics where it's clear what is true and what is not, such as the belief that Paul uh, highlights here that the resurrection has already happened. For others, it may be the centrality of the authority of the Bible uh, and having that front and center for a church or the sacrificial death of Jesus for sins front and center. This is not up for debate. Uh, You see, there is no uh, free speech in the church. Uh, Some heresies and untruths are not up for an extended uh, debate. Sure, you can ask questions, we can discuss them, but they're not up for extended debate or proclamation from the pulpit. Avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. Uh, Counter them uh, with love and gentleness and grace we'll sing. And more generally, I think some topics should be discussed and need to be uh, where there's kind of legitimate Christian uh, agreement, but talking about them too much and too often can lead to unproductive arguments and ungodliness. Uh, We do disagree on lots of things within the church. And if you find yourself quarreling or with a quarreling spirit towards someone or some topic, we need to be careful that we aren't swerving uh, from what's important Uh, guarding the gospel. We're careful with our words and the way we discuss God together. We don't want to be so dysfunctional in the way we talk to each other or so distracted in our speech, we're talking about other things, that actually we lose our ability to stand together for the gospel against heresies that assault it. Our our culture affects our ability to hold on to the truth. And so we watch our words But furthermore, we are very attentive to God's word. Uh, This is the, I think, the approximate opposite of uh, irrelevant arguments and controversies. The opposite of that is to diligently study God's word. Uh, Verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, Paul desires skillful, clear and accurate handling of God's word. A shoddy work will not be done in the church, particularly when handling the word. When we do that, Paul says, we should be ashamed. Uh, We had a shower replaced uh, recently and the home uh, home owner chose the cheaper quote and we all know what happened, right? The worker was not approved, made mistakes. It took longer, it cost more. We had a flood in our kitchen, not the bathroom, a flood in the kitchen one Sunday morning because of the work that was done. It was shoddy. A church needs workers who are not shoddy with the word but diligent and careful in handling it in preparing sermons and Bible studies well, in in addressing disagreements from the word, in setting the direction within the church by the word. The charge from Paul is we not be shoddy workers, but that I and the elders uh, give ourselves to studying the word, that our youth leaders, Bible study leaders, Sunday school teachers, that those we support on the mission field, are down, like Enoch down in Christchurch, are those who handle and know God's word inside and out. There's lots that requires. Uh, understanding individual words, being diligent in that. Understanding the context it was written in. Connecting our passage with the whole Bible and God's intentions for it. Thinking through the implications of how uh, this particular passage will uh, speak into general cultural things that are going on. Uh, It's important for a pastor and elders to know the hearts of those in their church that they may be able to meaningfully and specifically apply it to you. That there would be courage in each and every pastor and in myself to give the word to you straight just as God has given it to us looking to God for approval, not to people. Now, this is not always easy. Uh, Many things can distract uh, from sermon preparation and from God's word. Uh, The last month or so, uh, reading legal documents on property, uh, there's emails, there's health and safety, there's meetings, there's renewing, uh, reviewing uh, financial reports and the budget. Many 
things that need to happen and are good to do, uh, but can take away from rightly handling God's word as I have been commanded to do. Uh, So we need to guard our time. The elders, anyone who has real responsibility in the church uh, to teach, guard the time that they may handle God's word correctly. That is God's command to his workers. He asked, do your best at this discipline of handling God's word. Do your best. And so I'd ask you to pray for me and dad, uh, the elders of the church, and those who are involved in word-based ministry, that they would be faithful faithful in handling the word of God, that they would be thinking through uh, topics within the church and uh, the wider world theologically and well. And if we need uh, a reason to be doing this, handling God's word, what better one than in verse 18 there? These false teachers are coming and they are unsettling the faith of some. Uh, We want a settled, secure faith. And so we handle and teach the word of God well. In the face of that unsettled faith, uh, Paul, though, leaves us with encouragement verse 18, and so fittingly he brings encouragement from the words. Uh, God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Uh, Those two quotes there come from the book of Numbers. Uh, When Moses had a revolt on his hand, people trying to take over his leadership, uh, just as Timothy did, just as churches need to be aware of false teaching and those who would try infiltrate God's church. The message uh, and assurance from God is that though false teachers come, God's in control. He knows his people. He knows his appointed leaders. And false teachers who are in sin must depart from it, or they're not truly part of God's church. So how do we protect the church from a distorted gospel? By watching our speech and handling the word well. Next, we see we watch our character. Because to be a useful worker means pursuing purity from sin. Uh, In our current cultural climate, there's a real tension uh, between uh, competence uh, and character. Uh, Particularly in politics, you may feel that you have to sacrifice one for the other. You pick someone who you think's got good character, or you pick someone who you think is very competent. It's the same uh, in business. Uh, I've been listening to a biography of Elon Musk, and he is really quite the businessman. He's founded, owns, and kind of manages companies valued in the billions, and I think at one point uh, trillions of dollars, depending on the stock market. It's amazing what he has done uh, with robots, self-driving cars, a boring company, uh, taking astronauts into space, and he's like CEO of like seven companies. Uh, but boy, is he demanding, uh, quick-tempered, uh, trigger-happy to fire people often very unreasonable and demanding of those who work from him. There's a lady who works uh, for him, and he, her, pretty much her main job is to bring the personal touch. And so she goes around after Musk, soothing uh, those who have received his harshness. Um, he cares a lot about a population collapse, and so he's had 12 kids uh, with three different wives, though. So he's highly competent, Uh, in the business world, but there's question marks on his character. Uh, That is not the case in the church. God asks for both. Handle God's word correctly and competently and pursue purity. Uh, We will not have useful workers fit to proclaim the good news of Jesus without character. So that's what's said, and look at verse 20 and 21. Now in a great house, There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work." Uh, The great house there is God's church, his visible church. And in God's house, there are various vessels on a sliding scale. Some false teachers uh, hanging around. They are dishonorable and argumentative. On the other end, godly 
uh, godly vessels ready for honorable use. And within the church, uh, if you want to be used, if you want to be useful, you must be honorable. Uh, This is really a hard message. It's one because uh, it's easy just to go with competence. And in some ways it feels like you're getting a lot done, but it's not God's work. It's also hard because I've sat down with particular people and asked them, can you be useful in this role and in this way? And they've said, I can't. I've got sin in my life and it's really got me and I know that I just can't serve God like that. Don't feel like a vessel that can do that. Variety of sins, perhaps family is not uh, functioning well. There's just something in their life that they haven't dealt with and they're not ready for honorable use. And that's really hard. We want to be a church then who is discipling and pursuing purity. We need honorable members within this congregation who will be useful to God. Because if our lives are just riddled with sin, our God cannot use us. And so here's Paul's message for us, this command to us, verse 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Flee, run away from sin and pursue righteousness. Uh, Flee youthful passions. In context of this passage, I think that means the youthful passion perhaps of the hot-headed, argumentative spirit that the young can embody. Uh, Mark Twain, an America author and humorist, wrote, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to 21, I was astonished at how much he'd learned in seven years. That's that youthful passion, that argumentative attitude, that know-it-all attitude that is not at all useful to God in his church. But positively, we're to put on and pursue, I think, not just uh, right use in speech, but to pursue a full purity, a righteousness, a faith, love, and peace. You see, our character and conduct matter much to God. He wants us to be different in the church. He wants our leaders and teachers to be different, not chosen because they're successful, competent, and confident, but because they're pursuing purity and are honorable people. How do we keep the church from a, a distorted gospel? While by living out the implications of it. By being honorable people, are vessels useful to carry the gospel forward. By only putting forward those who you can see the word of God is truly working in their life and changing them. Paul isn't after a perfection. Uh, we will never, never be there. But he does want those who are pursuing righteousness, who are hungering for it and chasing after it. And lastly, we keep the church from a discorded gospel by our attitude towards opposition. The Lord's servants are to be godly and pastoral to opponents. I look at verse 24. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. There is a surprising uh, tenderness towards opposition here. Uh, Jerry Bridges, a Christian author, had a friend, uh, an ex-Marine who would sign off his letters, obviously a very tough guy, this ex-Marine, but he'd sign his letters with uh, keep tough and tender, uh, by which he meant that he was tough on himself, Uh, and tender towards others. And that's the attitude here. First half of 2 Timothy, we endure, we are are disciplined, we are tough on ourselves, willing to suffer. That's the first half. But that discipline is to lead to gentleness and patience with others. This is the attitude of pastoral care towards those who are being led astray. Being kind to everyone, enduring evil and correcting opponents with gentleness, it speaks about great personal discipline, doesn't it? 
and emotional control. But it also speaks to deep trust in God. I look at verse 25. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. A God grants repentance. It's his responsibility and work. And so we rest upon him and do so patiently with gentleness. Dad has talked about how now that he isn't a senior pastor anymore, he's relaxed, nothing's his uh, problem. I'm sure it's easy for him to be very patient and gentle when someone tells him what's wrong with the church. He's, it's not his problem. Whereas now I'm getting comments about losing my hair from stress. And so things are my responsibility. How easy now to be impatient or unkind when I feel stressed. Whereas we teach and correct We are surrendered to God and his ends. He grants repentance. So we rest on him and are able to be gracious and patient. And notice there that we are are after repentance first. Uh, We're not just trying to win an argument. Our people who have lost or distorted the gospel need repentance, not just a rethink. And repentance, uh, repentance that leads to a knowledge of the truth. And repentance is best brought about both by knowledge being put forward, but also by the character of the Christian presenting it. Note too that this is spiritual and supernatural. That's the peril we are dealing with. People are caught by Satan. It's not just intellectual. It's not just about how good your argument is. People are caught in the snares of the devil to do his will. How full of compassion Pity and love should, uh, how full of uh, pity, compassion, and love should we be towards those who have been led astray? Uh, Paul even says in 1 Timothy 4 uh, that deceptive spirits and demons will teach and lead people astray by what they teach. This is the opposition to the gospel. This is the true opposition to the gospel. And we need God to grant repentance. And so notice that Paul doesn't direct us to, in this instance, supernatural means uh, to deal with this, such as exorcism. But in this case, it's a natural means of preaching and teaching the truth clearly with an attitude of patience and gentleness. And in this way, the influence, the plans, and the will of Satan will be pushed back by godly teaching of God's word. This is how the truth about Jesus is strengthened and defended in the church. This keeps us from a distorted gospel. And so as you consider your friends or family who may be led astray, as you think about our church and its responsibility to the truth, what would Paul have us do? Watch our speech closely so that we're not argumentative or distracted. He will want us to be handling God's word correctly. He wants us to be setting ourselves apart as holy, seeking purity that we would be ready to be used by him. He would want us to approach our opponents with gentleness and patience and endurance, trusting God's power to overcome Satan trusting that God may grant repentance to those who we are speaking to. This is the charge of the church. It's what we have been left to do as we carry out the gospel. And as we've been going through Baptist Union uh, difficulties and arguments and thinking about property and all these things, I am constantly reminded to come back to whatever happens with the property, whatever happens with the union, We have the gospel. This church believes and holds the gospel, and we want to pass that on. We know this is the hope for the world, and so we want to treasure it and hold on to it, speak and discuss things well, seek purity that we may be useful to God in this world, that we would be gentle and patient and endure, trusting to God to be at work. So that's what we've been called to do.
Shall we do that together, church? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this charge that you have given us. Please help us to take it seriously. Uh, We stand before you. We thank you for the responsibility we have in having your word and in knowing the gospel. We thank you so much for saving us. Please, uh, Lord God, help us to be useful workers uh, and servants for you. Help us to pursue purity and godliness and love that we may be ready uh, to take your gospel forward. Please fill us with a great gentleness and patience and endurance as we go about discussing you and teaching others about you. Please, Heavenly Father, would this be a church uh, that in a hundred years from, from now still is handling your word well and holding on to the wonderful good news about Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, would you stand?